Hello, in this video, I'll try to present a comprehensive study on Ashish Waswani and his co-author's renowned paper, Attention is All You Need. This paper is a major turning point in deep learning research. The transformer architecture, which was introduced in this paper, is now used in a variety of state-of-the-art models in natural language processing and beyond. This video's contents are listed here. Introduction In sequence modeling and transduction problems such as language modeling and machine translation, recurrent neural networks, long short-term memories, and gated recurrent neural networks used to be firmly known as state-of-the-art approaches. Tasks like machine translation were traditionally handled by sequence-to-sequence -sequence architecture. Sequence-to-sequence -sequence is a neural net that transforms a given sequence of elements such as the sequence of words in a sentence into another sequence. Sequence-to-sequence -sequence models consist of an encoder and a decoder. The encoder takes the input sequence and maps it into a higher dimensional space. That abstract vector is fed into the decoder which turns it into an output sequence. The output sequence can be in another language. A very basic choice for the encoder and the decoder of the sequence-to-sequence -sequence model is a single LSTM for each of them. In 2015, Badenau and co-authors proposed a new attention-based model for machine translation. Since then, attention mechanisms have become an essential component of compelling sequence modeling and transduction models in a wide range of activities, allowing for the modeling of dependencies regardless of their distance in the input or output sequences. However, since RNNs were used in these architectures, they were all bound to the fundamental limitation of sequential computation that recurrent neural networks have, which prevents researchers from taking advantage of parallel processing and the power of GPUs. This paper introduces Transformer, a new deep learning architecture that doesn't use sequential processing and hence has a lot of potential for parallel processing. Model details. As I said, most competitive neural sequence transduction models have an encoder-decoder structure. The transformer follows this overall architecture. For both the encoder and decoder, it uses a stacked self-attention and pointwise fully connected layers as shown in the left and right halves of this figure respectively. Let us just disassemble this model and examine it in greater detail. Let's start by looking at the encoder's internals. Here is the transformer encoder. Let's start from the inputs. As you can see in the figure on the left, the first step is converting inputs into input embeddings. The transformer architecture was originally proposed for translation tasks. So, the inputs are series of words. Of course, the computers don't understand words. They can only work with numbers. So, we should somehow convert these words into numbers. This is what this embedding layer do. We could simply give the computer a dictionary and then represent each word by its number in the dictionary or by converting that number into a one-hot vector. But this is actually silly we need another more clever way for representing the words. This clever way is called word embeddings. Word embeddings are a method of representing words with vectors in such a way that similar words have similar vectors. For example, we want the word cat to have a similar vector with the word dog. And although cat and car would be almost next to each other in a dictionary, we want their vectors to be relatively different because they have different meanings and appear in totally different contexts. The process of collecting these embeddings is beyond the scope of this video. But if you want to learn more about it, check out Computer Field's excellent video on the subject. Link is available in description.
The embedding layer in transformer architecture produces a 512-dimensional embedding vector for each word in the sentence. Then it's passed on to the model's next component. Next stage is positional encoding. The purpose of positional encoding is adding some information about positions before feeding the embeddings to the encoder. But why does it matter? I'll remind you once again that the transformer architecture was designed with NLP tasks like translation in mind. So, I'll use sentences to illustrate the importance of position in understanding natural language correctly. Look at these two sentences. If we don't consider the position of each word, they're exactly the same thing because they're composed of exact same words. But we know that these two sentences are not the same at all. Actually, the fate of more than 3 billion people depends on whether the word Thanos comes first or last in that sentence. When working with words and sentences, it's vital that our models have a sense of positioning. But how can we achieve this? Recurrent neural networks inherently take the order of words into account. They parse a sentence word by word in a sequential manner. This will integrate the word's order in the backbone of RNNs. How can we add some information regarding word order, now that we are removing RNNs for the benefit of parallel computation and increase speed? In Transformer, Vaswani and co-authors try to add positional information by using the sum of current embedding vectors with a new vector that contains information on position of each word. The positional encoding should satisfy the following criteria. It should output a unique encoding for each time step. Distance between any two time steps should be consistent across sentences with different length. Our model should generalize to longer sentences without any efforts. Its values should be bounded. And it must be deterministic. A simple solution would be assigning a number to each time step linearly. That is, the first word is given 1, the second word is given 2, and so on. It would provide unique encoding for each time step and consistent distance between any two time steps. It also is deterministic. However, the problem with this technique is that not only may the values become rather huge, but our model could also be confronted with sentences that are longer than those in training. Furthermore, our model may not observe any samples of a given length, which would limit our model's generalization. Another possibility is to assign a number to each time step within the range 0 to 1, where 0 represents the first word and 1 represents the last. One of the issues it will create is the inability to determine how many words are present within a given range. To put it another way, the term time step delta does not have a consistent meaning across sentences. The authors of this paper introduce a new way for positional encoding that achieves everything we ask for in our checklist. In this method, instead of adding a single number to each and every element of the vector, we create a d-dimensional vector that contains information about a specific position in a sentence. Because word embeddings have 512 dimensions, the current model's encoding dimension will also be 512 dimensions, and the positional encoding vector will have 512 dimensions as well. In order to fill the elements of the vector, authors use a sinusoidal function. Keep in mind that there are two formulas, one for even and one for odd dimensions. The authors chose this function because they hypothesized it would allow the model to easily learn to attend by relative positions. Since for any fixed offset k, 
positional encoding at position P plus K can be represented as a linear function of positional encoding at position P. We can also imagine the positional embedding PT as a vector containing pairs of sines and cosines for each frequency WK. If you are interested in learning more about positional encoding in transformer architecture, check out Amir Hussein Kazem Nejad's excellent blog post on the topic, link to which is included in the description. The two components that I described so far, the input embeddings and positional encoding, are actually doing the pre-processing of data. The data goes through them only once, while the next part, which is where we do the real encoding, can and will be repeated several times. So, let's see what's ahead of us in the next step. A multi-head self-attention mechanism is the encoder's next element. Let's start with the self-attention, then move on to the multi-head attention mechanism. As an example, consider this sentence. What does the pronoun it refer to? Is it the animal or the street? It is easy for us to infer that it is pointing to the animal. But it is more difficult for an algorithm to do so. Self-attention may assist computers in comprehending these details about sentences. As you can see in the figure, when we were encoding the word it, part of the attention process was focused on the animal and baked a representation of it into the encoding of it. But how does self-attention work? Let's look at the process of encoding a single input embedding vector for the sake of simplicity. First of all, we should create three different copies of each input embedding. We multiply each vector with a weight matrix, which is learned through the training process. These three copies of the input embedding will be called query, key, and value vectors. The weight matrices can be square-shaped, so the result of their multiplication has same dimension as the embedding vector. Or we can choose non-square matrices. The authors of the paper chose these matrices in a way that the 512-dimensional input embedding was converted to three 64-dimensional embeddings after matrix multiplication. We use the query and key vectors to calculate score. Say we're calculating the self-attention for the first word, which in this example is thinking. We need to score each word of the input sentence against this word. As we encode a word at a specific location, the score decides how much attention to place on other parts of the input sentence. Then, we first divide the score values by the square root of the dimension of the key vectors. In this paper, this dimension was 64, so every score value was divided by 8. The results then have to go through softmax operation. Softmax normalizes the scores, so they are all positive and add up to 1. This softmax score determines how much each word will be expressed at this position. Clearly, the word at this position will have the highest softmax score, but sometimes it's useful to attend to another word that is relevant to the current word. The next step is where finally the value vectors come into play. We multiply each value vector with its corresponding softmax score. The goal is to preserve the values of the words we want to focus on, while fading out irrelevant words by multiplying them by very small numbers. The last step in self-attention is to sum up the weighted value vectors. This produces the output of the self-attention layer for the first word. The resulting vector is one we can send along to the feed-forward neural network. In the actual implementation, however, this calculation is done in matrix form for faster processing, 
So let's look at that now that we have seen the intuition of the calculation on the word level. In the actual implementation, embedding vectors of individual words are stacked on top of each other to create one matrix per sentence. So instead of vectors, we end up with query, key, and value matrices. The entire process of calculating the output will be the same as before, with the exception of using matrices instead of vectors. That's it for self-attention. Now, let's focus on multi-head attention. Instead of performing a single attention function with d-dimensional keys, values, and queries, the authors found it beneficial to linearly project the queries, keys, and values h times with different learned linear projections. In this work, Vaswani and colleagues employed eight parallel attention layers or heads. With multi-headed attention, we maintain separate query, key, and value weight matrices for each head, resulting in different query, key, and value matrices. As we did before, we multiply input embedding X by the WQ, WK, and WV matrices to produce Q, K, and V matrices. On each of these projected versions of queries, keys, and values, we then perform the attention function in parallel, yielding output values. This leaves us with a bit of a challenge. The feed forward layer is not expecting eight matrices. It's expecting a single matrix, a vector for each word. So we need a way to condense these eight down to a single matrix. How do we do that? We concat the matrices, then multiply them by an additional weights matrix, WO. This wraps up everything on multi-head self-attention mechanism. If you are willing to read more about it, check out Jay Alamar's great post about transformers. I have used a lot of his material in these slides. You can find the link to his blog post in the descriptions. The attention block is followed by an add and norm layer. In this layer, we first calculate the sum of output vector of attention block, which we just calculated, and the input embedding vector, which we retrieved in the first step. The aggregate is then subjected to layer normalization. But what exactly is layer normalization and why we should normalize our data? Let's begin with the later question. Normalization is good for your model. It reduces training time, unbiases model to higher value features, and doesn't allow weights to explode all over the place and restricts them to a certain range. All in all, it is undesirable to train a model with gradient descent with non-normalized features. There are more than one way to perform normalization two of which are represented in this slide. The main difference between these normalization methods is the way we calculate average and variance in order to normalize our data. You are probably familiar with the one on the right, the batch norm. In batch norm, we take all sentences in a batch, and for each feature in these sentences, we can find an average and a variance which will be used to normalize the data in that feature. For example, here we have a batch of two sentences, popcorn popped and tea steeped. You can see that each sentence is displayed by a matrix. Each row represents a word and contains the sum of input embeddings and the output of attention layer. In batch norm, we take one feature and calculate the average and variance of it. And then normalize the data so that the average is near zero and variance is about one. Of course, we should repeat this for other features as well. In the layer norm, we take the average and variance from all of the features of a single sentence instead. Let's see what it means using the same two sentences. Here we don't care about the fact that these two sentences are from the same batch. In order to obtain the average and variance, we simply use all of the features in every sentence. 
And again, after normalization, we'll have matrices with average of 0 and variance of 1. Layer normalization was initially intended to be used in recurrent neural networks because the result of batch normalization is depending on the mini batch size and it is not clear how to apply it to RNNs. The developers of transformer architecture chose it as their preferred method of normalization because it performs exceptionally well, especially in NLP tasks. In addition to attention sublayers, each of the layers in our encoder and decoder contains a fully connected feed-forward network which is applied to each position separately and identically. This consists of two linear transformations with a ReLU activation in between. Its general role and purpose is to process the output from one attention layer in a way to better fit the input for the next attention layer. Geva and colleagues gave this feed-forward network a more detailed look in their paper Transformer Feed-Forward Layers are Key Value Memories. They found out that the feed-forward networks in the transformer architecture tend to capture some linguistic patterns that might be one of the reasons of the transformer incredible performance in NLP tasks. As you can see in this figure, neurons in lower layers often capture shallow patterns, while higher layers capture more semantic ones. I'm going to use some examples to help you comprehend these patterns better. Several sentences can be seen here, and the feed-forward network of the transformer model appears to have connected them. Let's look at each collection of sentences and try to figure out why this induction exists. Shallow patterns are the ones that come from the words themselves. For example, all the sentences shown in the first row of this chart have substitutes at the end of them. Semantic patterns, on the other hand, are the meaning you induce from the sentence by looking at its words. In the second row of this chart, you can see sentences that end with base or bases, but also are related to military because of the presence of underlined words. Last group of patterns that are identified in the feedforward network are pure semantic patterns. Examples in the last row of the chart are all about TV shows, and the model has figured it out using the clue words such as episode, season, and NBC. After the feedforward block comes another add and norm layer that is just like the one that we have already described. So that's about the encoder. But before we shift our focus to the decoder module, I want to point out two more things. First, I just want to remind you of the residual connections. These connections send the output of each sublayer to the add and norm block of the next layer. Second, remember that the transformer architecture stacks several identical encoder blocks on top of each other. In the original paper, the number of stacked encoder units was six. Finally, we can talk about the decoder. First of all, we should point out the different modes that our decoder can work in them. When our model is in the training phase, we are fine-tuning the parameters of the network and the decoder is in the training phase. But when we are using our model to actually translate sentences, we are in the test mode. Imagine that we want to use transformer to translate sentences from English to French. Here is how the model works in the test phase. We first feed the English sentence into the encoder, which we now understand very well. The encoder has to process the entire sentence only once and will produce an output, which we will feed to the decoder. Usually, every output that the decoder has produced so far should be fed into it. But since the decoder has not translated anything yet, we simply give it a start of the sentence token to turn on its engine. Based on the encoder output and the initial start of the sentence token, the decoder then chooses the word that is most likely the correct translation. Now that we have our first output token, we can feed our decoder with both the start of the sentence token and the French word too. 
Once again, our decoder will try to find the best translation using the encoder output and previously translated words. We repeat this process for every word until our decoder decides the most probable output would be the end of the sentence token. This is when we stop the translation. As you can see, the encoder uses parallel computing and works quite quickly, whereas the decoder takes its time and produces output tokens one by one during the test phase. This time we were fortunate and our translation was flawless. However, if the decoder chose an improper word for translation in one of these steps, the model would have no way of knowing, and the result would not be as excellent as our example. In the training phase, on the other hand, we have the full perfect translation made by experts. We use these target sentences to adjust the parameters of our model so that it would produce the same translation if the same input sentence was given to it. To do so, we give the entire input sentence to the encoder and instead of giving only the start of sentence token to the decoder, we give it a part of the target sentence, so that it tries to predict what the next word would be. Of course, at the beginning, our model will perform poorly. But by fine-tuning the parameters in the backpropagation process, it becomes better and better in doing its job. As you see, in order to train the model, instead of using model output from a prior time step as an input, we use the ground truth. This strategy is called teacher forcing. Please keep in mind that during the train phase, both the encoder and the decoder can utilize parallel computing to speed up their training. In the actual implementation of the transformer model, instead of only a portion of target sentence, we can give the whole target sentence to the decoder during the training phase. I'll show you how this is done in the next slides as we go over the decoder's inner workings. The embedding and positional encoding steps of the decoder are identical to those of the encoder, so we skip them. The masked multi-head attention is the first attention layer in the decoder. This layer looks a lot like the one we saw in the encoder but it also masks the input. What does masking mean and how does it work? As previously said, we'd like to provide the entire target sentence to the decoder during the training phase so that our model could train quicker. The decoder gets the encoder output and full target value and then it is supposed to produce an output that is as much similar to the ground truth as possible. But if the decoder has access to every word in the target sentence, it would be cheating. This way, the decoder knows what its next output should be and it may harm its ability to generalize. In order to prevent our decoder from cheating, we use masking. For example, when the decoder is supposed to produce the fourth output token, we should mask every word from index 4 until the end of target sentence. The self-attention mechanism used in the decoder is just like the one we saw in encoder. The main difference is that in this self-attention mechanism, we apply a mask matrix on the scores. Mask is a matrix like this. It's an upper triangular matrix that all of the entries above its main diagonal are minus infinity. Adding this matrix to the score matrix will cause the softmax to assign zero probability for every forbidden word. Hence, the attention weight on these words will be zero. So, multiplying the output of softmax with our value matrix will prevent our model from accessing the words that are not translated yet. If you want to learn more about the masking procedure, I recommend you watch Leonard Svensson's video on this topic, link to which is available in the description. Keep this in mind that here again we are using multi-head attention. So these calculations will be done for several copies of key, query and value matrices. After this attention layer, our data goes through another add and norm layer, which we have already covered. 
Next step is the second multi-head attention layer. This is where we finally use the data that encoder produced. As you probably know by now, self-attention mechanism uses three inputs in order to produce an attended output. Key, query, and value. Let's see that for this particular self-attention mechanism, where do each of these values come from? Keys and values come from the encoder. Encoder takes the entire input sentence and produces an output. We take this output and make two copies of it by linear transformation. One of these transformations will be the key and the other will be the value for our self-attention mechanism. The last ingredient for self-attention, which is the query, comes from the decoder. Decoder takes the target sentence and in the first attention layer, it produces an attended output. Let's say we're currently working on the fourth word. So, the fourth and fifth token from target sentence are both masked, and the fourth token from the output of attention block will be used as the query. And the rest of self-attention process is just like before. You may have noticed that the output of this attention layer actually gets its values from encoder. The only influence the output of previous decoder attention layer has is that it contributes in the calculation of attention weights and also the output dimension of current attention layer is the same as the previous one. If you want to learn more details about this self-attention mechanism, I recommend you another video from Leonard Svensson's channel and you can find a link to it in the description. After this second attention layer comes yet another add and norm layer. The rest of decoder is very straightforward. First, we have a feed forward network just like the one in encoder. Then another add and norm, followed by a linear transformation, and then a softmax layer. Softmax layer will produce the output probabilities. Don't forget that just like the encoder, the decoder has residual connections that connects each sublayer to the add and norm block of the next layer. And just like the encoder, several decoder blocks are stacked on top of each other. In the original implementation of the paper, the number of these blocks was 6. Finally, as you can see here, the key and value data comes only from the top encoder block to each and every decoder block. Okay, this short took a lot of time to explain. Now let's see how does this complex architecture pay off. Results The authors created two different versions of the transformer model. A base model and a big model. This table shows some of the differences between these two models. Notice that even the base model contains the mind-blowing number of 65 million parameters. This chart shows the performance of transformer model in translation compared with other models. The model performs so great in English to German translation that even the base model beats every other model. In English to French translation, the big transformer model establishes a new state-of-the-art blue score of 41.8, outperforming all of the previously published single models at less than a quarter of the training cost of the previous state-of-the-art model. To evaluate if the transformer can generalize to other tasks, the authors performed experiments on English constituency parsing. Constituency parsing is the process of analyzing the sentences by breaking them down into subphrases, also known as constituents. These subphrases belong to a specific category of grammar like noun phrase and verb phrase. They trained a full layer transformer with model dimension of 1024 on the Wall Street Journal portion of the Pantry Bank, about 40k training sentences. 
They use a vocabulary of 16k tokens for this setting. They also train their model in a semi-supervised setting, using the Berkeley Parser Corpora with approximately 17 million sentences and a vocabulary of 32k tokens. This table shows the performance of transformer model in English constituency parsing task. It shows that despite the lack of task-specific tuning, this model performs surprisingly good and generalizes well to English constituency parsing. Conclusion The transformer architecture was introduced in this paper. It is the first sequence transduction model based purely on attention with multi-headed self-attention replacing the recurrent layers most typically employed in encoder-decoder architectures. For translation tasks, the transformer not only can be trained significantly faster than architectures based on recurrent or convolutional layers, but also performs much better than them. It achieved the state-of-the-art status on both English to German and English to French translation tasks, and in the former task, the best transformer model outperforms even all previously reported ensembles. Thanks for watching. I hope you find this video educational and informative. If you like this video, please subscribe to my channel. See you in the next video.